Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for attending this webinar. I saw that there was a message already asking um, for a soundtrack. So uh, if you could just confirm on messages that you can uh, hear clearly, that'd be awesome. Appreciate it. So my name is Marcus Darcy. I'm the general manager at Heapack Technology. I also have Mazen Awad here. He's the VP of Sales. Hello. And John Elfie, application engineer for the Northern Territories. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'll be doing the presentation, but we've got uh, Mad here to uh, answer um, any um, variety of questions you might need from a sales point of view. And John is monitoring the messages. So um, he'll be answering messages on the fly as we go through. Um, if it's something that he thinks everyone might benefit from, he might bring it up and we can talk about it. And we also have 10 or 15 minutes at the end to, um, to answer any more questions as well, if it takes a little bit of time to think about it. Also, just so you're aware, we do have an exit survey. We only have three questions, and um, as always, we're trying to improve. So any, uh, any um, good answers you can give on those three questions, we really appreciate it. Um, and we'll move on to this webinar. So the topic is smart pumped glycol systems, as you can see from the title. And I'll get started. So the reason for doing this webinar, this presentation, is to introduce our new products. Um, to identify what makes a difference um, so you can kind of get a visual of what it looks like and understand what sort of components and hardware is included um, and understand how it fits in with our existing range. Obviously, we're a heat pipe company and this technology is a little bit different. So why a pump water system? Well, first of all, we really want to focus on air-to-air -air energy recovery where we can add value. And we have experience in um, air-to-air -air energy recovery, as I say, but also sensible recovery. So glycol was something that we showed interest in, and we think there's a gap in the current market. Why do, you, why do we think there's a gap? Well, what we see is we see two types of solution in the market today. And the first solution we see is a uh, pumping through cooling coils at high flow rate, and you're getting typically 30 to 35% effectiveness. Uh, some people um, use the term poor man's glycol system for this. Um, it's kind of a simple system. There's not a lot of effort put into the design, but it's very easy to implement. Uh, the other type of system we see is what we believe is an over-designed system where there's a lot of complex functionality. However, the performance from an air-to-air -air energy recovery point of view is ambiguous. There's certainly, um, when I say complex functionality, there's definitely functionality there, but there's also a price tag associated with that. And what we're looking at is to fill the gap in between those systems. So we're looking at something a little bit more functional and reliable and high performing than um, what some people call a poor man's glycol system, but not with the extra complexities um, that people are paying for for these other systems. So first of all, to understand how it fits into our range, I'm going to talk a little bit about our current range. So this is all energy recovery, um, which we call HRM for heat recovery module. So the um, original model that we came up with was, was the H, and that has equal cooling and heating, where the pipes are horizontal. We can also turn it 90 degrees and use gravity to help um, get the best performance, and that's up to a 55% effectiveness. But it is single season. You see the warm air has to be on the bottom. There's also a product we came up with recently, which is the HRMZ, and it's an optimized, hence the Z, uh, for one season. In this case, it's optimized for heating, which would apply to most of North America. But there's also a B, which is optimized for cooling. And that could be used in southern Florida, out in Phoenix, Arizona, those, those sorts of places. What we're doing is we're using a little bit of tilt to um, use gravity to help us get better performance. However, we have special circuiting, so you still get some recovery on the off season. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to just look at the equal cooling and heating. So just zoom in on the HRMH. And if you just watch where it says tube orientation, we're going to actually swap that for a different field. We're going to call it max separation. So you can have 40 inches between your streams. Now, we have a second um, series of products as well in the HRM range. And that's the V, which is also called a split passive. So you see here, we can actually have 60 feet of separation. However, the performance is not as good. Um, so again, you can offset it and use gravity to help you get a little bit more performance. 
It also helps you get more separation. You see now it's, in, it's increased to 120 feet. And there's another um, option within this range, which is called the DSO. And what we're doing is we're using dampers to control the airflow over the coil so you can get the benefit of an offset, but with the two, the two season recovery. And again, there's 120 feet. So if we continue to look at the equal cooling and heating, the two season applications, this is where the water system comes in. So what we're looking at here is now not a passive system with no moving parts, but it's actually got a pump that's going to be pumping water glycol mixture around. However, that allows you to go over 200 feet. And that's what gives us, that, that's, that's how this system complements the existing product range. So why smart? So as I said, we're, we're aiming for filling a gap from quite a simple system to a very complex system. And we ask ourselves, what do we really want to provide the customer? Where can we add value? So the first area we add value is that we provide a whole system design. So we're not just providing coils, and we're not just providing hydronic equipment. We're providing both of those. So if there's a problem with the system, you know we're responsible for it, and we'll be responsible for making sure it, it works properly and fixing any issues there are. We're applying a modular approach, which means that we're putting a lot of effort into the pre-engineering so that it, it's configurable rather than custom. So we can come up with solutions for your problems um, based on pre-engineered systems. And by not having to do custom engineering, we're managing to maintain those costs down, which leads us on to affordable. It's priced for function and performance. And also, because of the modular approach, again, it's not, you're not paying a custom price for it. Reliability was really important to us because, as I said before, all the other products we make are passive. And we wanted to make sure that this product was complementary to that range and not a contradiction. So as a result, we're, we believe in the system so well that, that uh, we're offering a five-year warranty. And that's despite some of the components on the skid only having a one-year warranty. We're taking, the, um, we're taking the warranty on to five years for all those components. And in terms of technology, um, We've applied some of the IP that we've developed and learned with developing heat pipe systems and seeing how can we transfer that across to a water system. And uh, that, that'll become a little bit more evident as we talk through, as I, as I walk through the slides, saying why our coils are better. The other side is that we're providing a more sophisticated uh, control system with a tactile touch screen, touch screen, touch screen sorry and an intuitive control system. So it's very easy for the building owner to see what the system looks like and what the system is doing. So in terms of the scope, this is what HPT provides. We provide the coils. And as I said, because it's a whole system, we provide the pump skid. And on that skid, there's the hydronic components like expansion tanks, airflow separator, pumps, that sort of thing. And also the control components, the mm -hmm. sensors and the um, control panel. We also provide air temperature sensors. Uh, those are mounted before and after the coils, and they would ship loose because they can't be mounted on the pump skid. Others provide the piping between the coils um, and the skid, and also insulation. Uh, the power and the controls wiring between the coil skid and BAS. Um, so the controls wiring, for example, is for the temperature, air temperature sensors and wiring to the BAS and glycol and corrosion inhibitor and the startup process. So that's all pretty standard on normal hydronic systems. In terms of warranty, I've already mentioned the five-year warranty. So what we're providing is a 12 months parts and labor, and then the subsequent four years are parts only. It covers the coils and the hydronic components. So as I said, some of those hydronic components, their manufacturers give it a one-year warranty. We're extending that up to five years. And one caveat is that you do need to follow the IOM to qualify the warrant for the warranty. And just like an obvious example of that is appropriate care of the glycol. If the system gets charged with straight water and no inhibitor or no glycol and that causes a problem downstream, um, like for example in winter, then that, that would obviously be an issue regarding the warranty. However, they're going to be all sensible, like sensible steps that need to be followed. So this is an example of what a pump skid looks like. Um, on the left, you can see there are two pumps. 
the big red uh, vessel is the expansion tank. The smaller red vessel is the air separator. And you see there are two um, electrical enclosures. The upper enclosure is for the control panel, and the lower enclosure is the power panel and the VFDs. Now, I'm not going to go through every um, component on there, but I just wanted to show you this picture so you could see that basically the whole system minus the coils is on this skid. So you have a module that you can install into your building. What we do is we size our module based on the flow rate. It's actually limited by the um, air separator. So the 2 inch, 3 inch, and 4 inch refers to the pipe diameter that we normally use on the skid and that connects the skid to the coils. And you can see the varying um, gallons a minute that those skids will provide. Now, I also provided approximate CFM. It's, the reason I say it's approximate is because I've made some assumptions. I've said, well, your coils um, have the same fin height and fin length. Well, that's, that's not entirely true. Um, you could have a bigger fin height than fin length, or you could have a bigger fin length. What I'm really doing here is showing you an example of ballpark. This is the type of system you might use this skid on. And I've assumed 500 feet per minute, which is very reasonable, but sometimes on the high side when it comes to energy recovery. Obviously, the CFMs can be higher if you're using a longer face length because your, your square footage of your coil is bigger. So we showed two pumps. Uh, we do have a one pump option, although what we've seen is that um, customers have exclusively been interested in two pump option. That gives the 100% redundancy. Um, we also have indoor outdoor options. And what that's really centered around is how the electrical enclosures are protected and the valves as well, that there's a NEMA 4 enclosure that's available for the valves, and it's actually a different actuator that goes on there. So that, that would be an outdoor version. So if we look at how the fluid flows through the skid, um, I'm going to give you an example where we're heating, so it's, so it's like a winter up north. And uh, either we've got full performance or the performance only being modulated by the pump speed. So in this example, you can see uh, warm return air water uh, coming into the skid um, through the air separator, um, through the pump, and back out again. And we also have return, air, uh, sorry, return water from the supply air, which is cold, thrown by the blue. And some people wonder, well, why, why, is, that, um, why is that looping through the system? And the reason is because there's going to be bypass to help control. And I'll touch on that in a moment. So this is how the coils are connected up to the skid. So here you can see that um, there's two coils, and it shows the temperature sensors upstream and downstream of the coils. Just take a moment to show you that the water temperatures um, are being measured on the skid. And as I said, the only sensors that are not on the skid are the air temperature sensors, and you can see those in the green. And those are what would have to be wired to the controls. Everything else is already pre-wired on the skid in the factory. So when we decide to modulate, remember I was saying that this, uh, this small loop of blue water, now we've shown it as blue and orange. Um, that's, where you, that's where you would want to modulate because you're trying to hit a set point and or because you're trying to avoid frost on your uh, return air coil. So you'll bypass the supply air coil a little bit to try and keep the water temperature higher. That shows you how that bypass is being used. And you can see the yellow circles indicate where there are control valves. Now, one interesting thing on our system is that we don't use a three-way valve. We actually use two inline valves. And the reason for that is that, manage, that means that we can delink the relationship between bypass and inline resistance. So as the system curve moves around for different conditions, uh, we can actually uh, play with that. We don't have to follow just the, the set curve from a three-way valve. We're also measuring gauge pressures before and after the pumps. And that's used for two reasons. It's to make sure that the suction pressure on the pump is sufficient to avoid cavitation. And it's used to calculate differential pressure to prove that the pumps are actually creating a head. Here we've got a few pictures just showing um, some testing we were doing in the factory. So we recognize that um, glycol changes viscosity quite substantially with temperature. 
And with quite a lot of literature search, we're finding that um, there's no single answer on how that viscosity changes. So we decided to test it ourselves. So in sunny Florida, um, here we are creating frost in our system. We're actually running 20 degree water through that system. Um, and actually, well, changing temperatures between roughly 70 room temperature down to 20 degrees so that we could see how the glycol um, changed in viscosity with temperature. An interesting point on that is actually it, its behavior is dependent upon what it's flowing through. So if it's flowing through a coil versus through a big pipe, uh, the geometry around the glycol actually affects the viscosity. So it's very, it's very informative for us to, to have done that testing, but that also shows that there's value in our ability to test these things and make sure that we can predict what the glycol is going to do. So a quick look at the coils. So first of all, I want, I want to look at what would happen with a cooling coil and then challenge that and say, well, this is what we're doing with energy recovery. So when you're designing a cooling coil, um, often you'll buy a coil that is certified to HRI 410. That applies for um, chilled water between 35 and 55 degrees. So that's a relatively narrow band. Generally, we want to have a low change in fluid temperature. And that's best for the chiller to be as efficient as possible. Um, that, that can be achieved by increasing the fluid flow, um, but that means more head drop in the system. And therefore, there's going to be a sweet spot at which um, you decide this is, this is the optimal flow rate. Another thing that affects the optimal flow rate is the velocity um, that the fluid flows through the coil at. And it's important to keep a higher velocity so that you can keep that turbulence in the pipe and make sure that the, um, the heat transfer ratio is sufficiently high for an efficient coil. And also, as I mentioned, a higher fluid velocity also keeps your, del your fluid delta T down to help with chiller efficiency. And the other aspect of that is that most chilled water coils are still 5 8 Even though in many refrigerant applications, um, coils are going down to 3 8 and, and these microchannels as well, um, on water systems, there's still, there seems to be resistance to that, and, and uh, they're still really mostly around 5 8 and the reason for that is as you need your higher velocity water flow, um, you go to a smaller pipe diameter and the pressure drop increases ma massively. So when I say resistance, that is a pun intended. So here's our change in paradigm. The first thing is that our water temperature varies substantially. So in the summer, when it's 95 degrees outside and maybe your return air is 75, well, your average water temperature is going to be about 85 degrees. In the winter, when maybe it's zero degrees outside and your return air is 70 degrees, well, you're looking at 35 degrees. So now we're looking at a broader range between 35 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. The other thing is we want the fluid to change temperature. And why is that? So if you think of a thought experiment where you have an infinite flow of liquid, if you have an infinite flow of liquid, then your heat capacity is infinite. So your water won't change temperature. But if your water doesn't change temperature, and its temperature is the average air, temp average air temperature between the two air streams, then you can never get an effectiveness bigger than 50%. So having too much fluid flow is actually a problem. It actually limits your effectiveness to 50% or less. The other thing is, as we've seen in the refrigeration industry, is that smaller tubes perform better because as you go to a smaller diameter, the ratio between the surface area and the volume of that pipe um, gets bigger. You have more surface area for heat transfer for the certain amount of liquid in there. So as a result, we've looked at trying to keep the velocity through the coil down below three feet per second. What we've done is we've incorporated an internal geometry that maintains the turbulence. So remember I say on the cooling coil, the typical range is four to eight feet per second. We're keeping it below three, but we've, we've got a special geometry inside our tube um, that is maintaining that turbulence at low velocities. And that enables it to be more controllable. And that geometry is based on IP that we've developed with, uh, with our heat pipe coils. So just looking at the coils um, in general, 
We're using half inch pipe, so that's smaller than five eighths. We have a 28,000 um, wall, so it's thicker than our heat pipes. It's uh, a little bit thicker to um, help with those uh, more um, kind of the, the conditions of uh, the water being pumped through the tube, so uh, to prevent erosion becoming a problem. The sine wave fins are 6,000 thick, and we um, found the sweet spot is at 12 fins per inch. And also our sweet spot is six rows deep. So when I say sweet spot, um, what I mean is that as you add extra rows, you get diminishing returns. Um, so you're proportionally increasing costs, but you're not proportionally increasing performance. Um, similarly, when you go to lower rows, it's, um, it's cheaper, obviously, proportionally, but then your drop in performance is greater. So we kind of found the sweet spot for our diameter tube, our sine wave fins, um, is about six rows deep. So you can get the coils in sections up to 75 inches tall. And the total height is 210 inches, and that's based on the largest skid that I mentioned before, which is actually 210 gallons per minute as well. Now, looking at the fluid, uh, we've characterized performance for water. And there are conditions when you actually don't need glycol. However, you still need an inhibitor to avoid corrosion. Uh, varying ethane glycol percentages and varying propylene glycol percentages. And what we found is in our application, the performance doesn't change that much with glycol. Uh, it's really the viscosity, the resistance in the system that's changing. So, for example, if you had a 30% propylene glycol application, we would size the pump for 40% just to make sure that we had enough pump head generated. Um, but you would still get the performance that would be showing. Now, I'm also going to walk you through um, a little chart that shows how the glycol has an effect on, on that performance there. So remember I said um, in, a, in a previous slide that an infinite flow of refrigerant means that you can't get more than 50% effectiveness? That's what I'm showing here. So at the beginning, when you have a very low gallons per minute, your performance is pretty much proportional to gallons per minute. And it gets better and better until it hits a, hits a peak. But at that peak, it starts to plateau off and then actually starts to drop. Now, I've squashed this up a little bit to show that the um, plateau isn't as big as it actually is, um, just so you can see uh, diagrammatically what, what's going on here. So we designed for the winter conditions. So we make sure that we have the right gallons per minute in the system for the winter condition. And the reason for that is that's when the glycol is most viscous and most difficult to pump. So in the summer, when it's easier to pump, if you ran your pump at full speed and you had your control valves wide open, you would actually be operating on a condition further right, and that's where the performance could drop off a little bit. And that's one of the reasons that we have two one-way valves, uh, two inline valves, is that we can actually manipulate the system curve for our pump system based on how the conditions change. As I said, the water temperature changes significantly between summer and winter, and we need a system that can um, behave dynamically towards that. So a quick look at the control panels. I mentioned before that the upper panel is the control panel. The lower panel is the power panel, and that includes the ABB drive. So we've designed for 460-volt applications and 230-volt applications. Uh, for those in Canada that might be using 575, um, we're very capable of doing that. We haven't, haven't pre-engineered that yet, but that's just around the corner. The control panel itself runs off 115 volts, um, but you don't need to worry about that because that is coming from the power enclosure. You just have to provide your 460 or 230 or 575. Um, you can see in the bottom picture on the right, there's a 10-inch touch screen. And that's where I say that the whole system is really showed on one screen, so it's very intuitive to see what's happening. And as you can see there, there's water temperatures, air temperatures, the pumps are shown, all that, all that good stuff. The system also connects to the building automation system, either through Modbus or Backnet, and the connections can either be MSTP or Ethernet. And it also runs alone. So if you're a customer who is very keen on making sure that the system is hooked up to your building automation system and communicating both ways, we can do that. If you're a customer who um, is maybe limited on your controls budget, um, we can give you exactly the same system and it'll operate perfectly as a standalone system. We also offer some dry contacts, so if you don't have a BMS and you um, need to have some alarms or activate other things, uh, we do have some dry contact outputs, and I'll touch on those in a slide or two. 
So this is a snapshot from the screen. Um, as I said, we're trying to get most of the information on one screen. Uh, you can manage the set points from this screen. So you can see on the right here that the supply has set point where it says SAT, SCT. That is a, a default of 55. That's typically what people try to heat to. Um, and on the left, we have an exhaust set set point, 35. So the items in green are items that you can click on and edit um, straight on the display or through the BMS. You can also review and manage alarms. The little icon on the bottom right, you see there's a red alarm on this snapshot. There's actually an alarm active there. So you could click that and see what's active and you can see your history of alarms. And all that can be managed through the BAS. So looking at the control sequence, what I've done is I've uh, taken a site chart and carved it up into different areas. So first of all, we're gonna look at the cooling area, the, the area that's red. And this is when the outside air temperature is bigger, higher than the return air temperature. So the return air is being used um, as a heat sink to cool the outside air. Sorry, just to touch on that. So the system is always at full capacity because the outside air can never be cooled below the return air. The pumps will be running full speed to get as much energy recovery as possible. The next regime is heating. So in this case, the outside air is cooler than the return air. It's also below the supplier set point. So the system is trying to maintain the set point. So what it's doing is it's using PID modulation. And first of all, it controls pump speed. And then when the pump is running at minimum speed, then it starts to control the valves to um, put extra bypass in and to put extra resistance in line with the coil. There's also a frost control. And what that is used for is on your very cold days when your exhaust air could be cooled below freezing and condensed, um, then by bypassing the water around the supply coil a little bit, we can increase the average water temperature and avoid that frosting. And that's where I mentioned the dry contact. So for example, when we go into a frost control regime, we do have a relay that gives you a dry contact output to say, hey, you know what, if you have a preheat, this would be a good time to be using that preheat so I could run at full capacity. So the middle regime is economizer. So this is officially still heating mode, but the problem is we're already above the set point. The outside air is already above the set point. So what happens there is your pump is already running minimum speed, you're bypassing all your water, and the system realizes this and it turns the pump off and it essentially goes to sleep and that will um, monitor the conditions around it and wake up when it needs to leave economizer mode. This is another element where we have a dry contact output. So for those people who don't have a building automation system, you could use that output, for example, to activate a bypass damper so that during those economizer hours, um, you're not having to pay for the pressure drop across the coils. You can actually bypass those and save some energy. So in terms of pump management, I mentioned that we have two pumps normally. Um, the controller will manage those two pumps and it will count the accumulated hours that each one has run. Every time the system starts up, it'll look at what the runtime hours is and it'll pick the, lower, the pump with the lower runtime hours. What that is to do is to balance out the loading on the pumps over time. And the pumps are 100% redundant. So you only need one pump to run, um, to run the whole system. And if that pump were to fail, the system would detect that and it would start running the, the second pump. So how does it know that a, that a pump has failed? Well, it's measuring the pressure drop across the pump. So basically, or the pressure increase across the pump. So basically the head's been generated. So if the pump is being told to operate and it's not generating a head, that creates a, a fault alarm and that tells the controller to activate the second pump. The other protection we have is that the suction gauge pressure is being measured and the system will not run unless that gauge pressure is above a minimum threshold. And the reason for that is to protect that pump from either running dry or from cavitating because there wasn't sufficient head going into the system. So this slide really just shows you the sort of information you would, you would get from a submittal from us. Again, the idea is this is pre-engineered, so we can give you um, a pretty good 
uh, submittal documents with some comprehensive information quite quickly. The inputs you need to make a selection are very similar to a heap pipe. Uh, we are selecting it in the office right now with the applications engineers. So um, you do need to reach out to your local rep or, or directly to the office if you, if you have an application. And you would need, to, at least to get an initial um, selection, you would need to get CFM, like airflow, um, the temperatures that the system is exposed to and what you're trying to achieve, and the, the geometry of the airflow, so height and length available for coil size. So I'm going to walk you through an example application. So it's actually a pretty small system. This is 8800 CFM. Um, I'm showing the schedule at the bottom of the screen, and uh, yes, it is too small to read. I apologize for that. Um, but that's there for a purpose. It's just to show that this was an actual schedule. We really did quote this job. And I'm going to summarize the key information here so you can read it. So the schedule requested a system that had 133 gallons per minute. The accumulated head drop through the system was 35 to 36 feet. It required 40% propylene glycol. And it had two different size coils, one in supply, one in exhaust. They were similar, but a little bit different to each other. And the pressure drop across those coils was a half inch to 0.6 inch at 500 feet per minute. The return air was 70 degrees. And when we were warming the outside air in winter, the schedule was requiring us to warm it from zero up to 36 and a half. And in the summer, it was requiring us to cool from 95 down to 82.9. So this is what we came up with. This, uh, the graphic on the left is an example of what our uh, performance output would look like. And this is what we proposed. So first of all, our system is lower gallons per minute. And if you think back to the coil design, where I was talking about the paradigm change, this is where you start to see the differences. We're using a slower fluid flow through our coils, and that means lower gallons per minute. We had a little bit more head. It's 50 feet. However, when you look at the gallons per minute and the head combined, the pumping water is actually 43% less power than the original schedule required. I skipped the propylene glycol, because obviously we're going to meet that requirement. Um, the coils we're providing, it was two identical coils, and we actually used six rows instead of eight rows. They also were around 0.5 inches. Um, we had a slightly lower face velocity because we were able to fit a bigger coil into the system. Now, what I will draw your attention to is um, it's hard to see on the left, so if you can't read it, I, I apologize. You, you're going to have to trust me on that one. Um, we're actually showing a bigger pressure drop on the exhaust coil. We're showing 1.05 inches. But we're also showing condensation. And this is where our selection process can be very valuable. So in this application, um, we knew that in winter, there was going to be condensation across the exhaust coil. And that condensation on the fins causes a greater pressure drop. So even though the schedule said 0.5 to 0.6 um, inches of, of water column drop, we actually knew that we were going to be getting 1.05. So when we provided that quote, we were able to educate the engineers to be thinking about the condensation he might get in his exhaust coil in the winter and maybe design for that extra pressure drop in the system. So in the winter, we were hitting 42.1 Fahrenheit. So we exceeded the goal. And presumably, we were designing to the summer condition because we got very close to the summer condition, um, which was 82.3. So hopefully, that gives you a good idea of how we're different, how we can meet existing performance but do it using, consuming less power by the pumps. So in conclusion, we have an active system, but it does complement our passive products. Um, the reason it complements it, our existing products, is because it can cover longer distances between airflows. It's insensitive, insensitive to gravity. So in this system, we don't have to make sure that the heat source is lower or level with a heat sink. And it includes controls, which is also new for our company. The system has a greater or equal to 50% effectiveness of 500 feet per minute. Now, that's sensible effectiveness, but that is particularly useful when meeting code for labs. It's a modular design so that we can um, provide selections relatively quickly and also at an economical cost. 
We're responsible for the whole system. So remember I said we're, we make the coils and we make the skids. We're responsible for all of that. And also we have flexibility in the controls. It can be, it can interface with the BAS and it can stand alone and just operate itself without any, without any interface BAS. And we continue to work on advances. As I said, we got three questions at the end of this presentation. And uh, we always like your feedback to um, think about what we should be looking at next. Any questions? Yeah, we had a few. Um, we're going to be quicker if you answer them. So one is, can you recover? Uh, can you recover energy from multiple exhaust streams for a single DOAS unit? Okay, so can we recover energy from multiple exhaust streams for a single DOAS unit? Yep. So. One of the constraints we have right now is that we're measuring the upstream and downstream temperatures of each coil. And our controls are only designed to measure four air temperatures. So we're really looking at one airstream right now. We've actually been inundated with requests like this. So we are looking at what we might do in the future. Um, but in the short term, we have two solutions. Uh, one solution would be to actually have two systems where half your DOS unit um, has one coil and one coil in one pump skid system going off to one exhaust, and the other half airstream has another coil which is um, being linked to the other exhaust. I know that's not always useful if your exhaust airflows vary between the two. Um, the other one we're looking at is whether you need to measure the air temperatures on both exhaust airstreams. If you can guarantee that they're always the same and they always see the same conditions, we could do that. However, from an engineering point of view, I recommend we don't do that. Um, so right now, yes, kind of, but we're looking to do a better job in the future with that. So next up is who manufactures the pumps and hydronic components? Okay, so who manufactures the pumps and the hydronic components? We're using Taco. Um, we recognize that there were um, really three big brands in the industry. And uh, we've decided that Taco is, is a really good opportunity for us. Um, we have a good relationship. We believe we're going to get really good customer service. And for us, that's important because of the warranty we're going to offer. The expansion tank and the air separator are also Taco. Um, the valves are the Limo valves. And I think I've covered most of the components there. All right. So let's see. Can the pump skids be broken down for shipping splits? Oh, good question. Can the pump skids be broken down for splitting shifts? So I haven't been asked that before. Um, and today, the answer would be no. Um, we've really designed one welded structure, and we've really tried to de design it as compact as possible so it could fit into a small space. We have tried to design at least the smaller systems to fit through a doorway. Um, so it would be interesting to see if, you, if, with those things in mind, whether you still needed to break it down. If you did, maybe we could look at a more mod, even more modular approach where we had two separate modules that hooked together. That would be a new product development, though. We have somebody asking if they can provide their own pumps and valves and um, uh, all, that, all the other components. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so the question is, can we um, work with someone where they provide their own valves or other hydronic components? We really don't want to be getting into that because part of the value that we're adding is responsibility for the whole system. Um, and that's where we're, we're adding warranty that actually extends beyond the warranty of the, of the separate components. And that's because we believe in the system that we've designed. And that's a way of adding value to the customer. Yeah. Just to add to that, um, sometimes I know that um, facilities will really like to have the same brands of components in all their systems. Um, so, for example, if a customer had Bell & Gossett pumps, um, they would want to make sure that they could um, swap out a broken pump with a new one very easily. P part of our five-year warranty is that we would be holding on to pumps in stock so that we could give you a very fast replacement if necessary. Uh, we have one, they're asking about the piping. I'm assuming the interconnecting piping, but uh, yeah. is it steel, copper groove connections, sweater flanged? 
Gotcha. So we provide a flange connection, and it can be regular Schedule 40 uh, steel piping. Um, so that's a difference between this product and our split passive products, where the split passive um, is using copper piping between the coils. Our pump system is using steel piping. And we provide flanges, but it's really down to the engineer and the contractor exactly what joints you have between, um, between the pump skid and the coil. All right, so a lot of questions actually. Um, Good. Concerning the software selection, is it okay to have access to it? So what we have is um, we have our, our own selection software that you may or may not have used, which is Select Plus. And we have a development program where we're cascading um, our products into Select Plus. So we go through a proving time where we um, where we actually have some products available in Select Plus, but only to our own employees. So we can really prove out the selection. We're doing that currently with a split passive. And um, so the idea is that the next product to go in would be the pump system, um, but it would be quite some time of proving through that process uh, before it's released to the general public. But ultimately, that would be the plan to release it to the general public. There we have, can the controls accommodate VAV systems? Can the controls accommodate VAV systems? So the way the controls work is they will maintain performance to a certain set point. So for example, if your airflow changes, and therefore the effectiveness in the coils changes, then your pump will speed up or slow down, and your bypass valve will open or close in order to maintain a set point. Um, the one caveat there is that if airflow actually stops, then um, the system only behaves on the temperatures around it. So depending on what the conditions are, the, the system might continue running at minimum speed or it might actually stop. So if you have a building automation system, that's where you say, hey, the fans have stopped, let's deactivate the pump system and that'll stop as well. So the short answer is yes, it will work with a VAV system. Uh, I think that's the majority of them. That's pretty much all of them. Great, well, that, that was a really good set of questions. Um, whilst people are coming up with more questions, maybe, I'll just go over some of the comments at the bottom of this screen. So if you want more information um, on this product or other products, you can go to heatpipe.com. Um, if you need to get a certificate for attendance, um, you can email at sales at heatpipe.com, and we can confirm and give you a certificate that you attended this um, session. And we really do appreciate your feedback. Those are excellent questions. Um, certainly appreciate your feedback on the exit survey questions as well. So if you can take the time to answer our three questions, that'd be awesome. Got a couple more if you want to. Yeah, sure. So this is a little, <clears throat> can be complex, but they're asking, when should we propose um, heat pipe or split passive versus glycol loop? It's a... <laughs> Do you guys want to take that question? <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> okay, so the question is um, when do you propose a split passive versus a glycol? Um, so the first thing to look at is the distance between your airstreams, right? If you're exceeding 120 feet, it's going to have to be a pump system. Uh, the second thing to look at is whether you want a two-season system. Um, if it doesn't have to be two-season, and if your um, warmer air is lower, then a split passive is probably your answer as long as you're within 120 feet. Um, if you want a two-season system, then you're really looking at the DSO and the pump system. So they both have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, the pump system is obviously a little bit more expensive because you're paying for a pump kit. And the DSO is lower cost, but um, the dampers do limit some of the face area. So you get a little bit more air side pressure drop. So what I'd recommend is actually run selections for both options and compare the price and compare the performance, and it would be a personal choice on which one to take. All right, and I think last one is, can you provide an energy analysis and a financial performance guarantee? Okay, so we're aware that there's a company out there that uses the word guarantee, um, and what we're trying to we're trying to understand how do we provide a system that is guaranteed to perform 
Um, but instead of just throwing out the word guarantee, we actually provide a meaningful, essentially, guarantee, right? So that really falls down to warranty, where from our point of view, if we have a condition and we say we're going to give you a certain performance and we're not getting that, that's a warranty. So I, I am yet to under, fully understand the difference between a guarantee statement and a warranty statement. But I think that our warranty is just as meaningful as a guarantee. And I think the third element is, um, as, as you're probably aware, all our energy recovery products are certified through, well, all our energy recovery products are certified uh, through HRI 1060. Um, the pump system doesn't qualify for that right now because of HRI rules. Um, but we are looking at that to see if there's some third party process we can go through um, to demonstrate to our customers that we perform. That was a tough one. Yeah, that was a tough one. <laughs> Uh, is it? So we schedule an hour. We're a little bit faster than that. So we want to give people a couple more minutes to ask questions. So anything that we missed, I can always go back and okay. ask a lot of questions. So anything that I missed, we can always go back and answer one on one. All right. Yeah, I would say through sales of teeth by questions that you think of afterwards, mm -hmm. sales of teeth and we'll get back to them. Basically. So um, <clears throat> we uh, finished a little bit faster than we expected. And uh, if we haven't given you enough time to ask some questions, or if as soon as you hang up, you think, man, I, I wish I asked that question, feel free to email sales at heapipe.com, um, and we'll get back to you with answers. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for attending. All right.